Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Christy Howell. I work in the Center for Sustainability at JCCC. I'm Education and Engagement Coordinator there. And um, in today's brief little lecture, we're going to spend some time together talking about corporate social responsibility. Um, by the end of our time together today, I hope that you'll understand some key concepts um, in CSR, the context in which it was developed, and some of the considerations that we need to keep in mind as we go forward regarding corporate social responsibility and the folks that we do business with. So our plan for the day is pretty simple. Um, we're going to start with defining sustainability. Um, and then we're also going to define corporate social responsibility and sort of take a look at how those two things fit together, right? Um, hopefully, we'll also understand motivations for CSR, why different companies get involved in it. Hopefully, we'll also dig in a little bit to who's doing this work well, um, and then talk through how to spot some fakers, folks who look like they're doing this work well on the outside, but once you dig in, not so much. Um, and then we'll also examine JCCC as a case study for corporate social responsibility. Even though we're, we're not a corporation, we do embody some of the, the best practices of CSR in the work that we do in the Center for Sustainability. So it's useful to take a look at those. Um, since this is a, a recorded lecture, you won't be able to engage with the Q&A um, afterward, but uh, we always encourage your comments, your questions, your um, points you'd like to raise in addition to the things that we talk about. You're welcome to do that uh, via email or in uh, social media comments if you'd like below if you're finding this on Instagram or YouTube or Facebook. Um, we will keep an eye on those periodically. If we don't get back to you quickly, drop us a line. Sustainability at jccc.edu. We're happy to continue the conversation wherever you'd like, um, and we would enjoy nothing more. So with all that, let's go. So what is sustainability? Um, we always have this conversation about defining sustainability at JCCC, and so many people start out thinking that it really is recycling and light bulbs. Um, that's a lot of times what people see the most of, right? Um, and sustainability really is about more than energy and waste. Um, sustainability is wonderfully complex and wonderfully complicated. Um, there's a lot of room for a lot of different people and moving pieces within it. Um, and that's why we often turn to a graphical definition uh, for the term. So, the definition that we employ um, a lot of times here at JCCC for this basic idea of sustainability is that it's a, an overlapping Venn diagram of three different terms, social, environmental, and economic, C, S-E-E. -E. So let's do environmental first because that's the one that most people identify with, right? And environmental concerns within sustainability really do look at the overall environmental health of our air, our water, our soil, um, and our, our animal and plant life around us, right? And so within um, that broader environmental concern, we also look at social issues. How do humans interact with the environment and with each other? Because people live within the environment, right? And the people who live within the environment um, manage, consume, and produce all sorts of different resources. And so the people within the environment contribute to ideas of environment, economic sustainability um, and how we manage those resources um, as people on this planet. So hopefully you can see both um, how each of these pieces work together and how they're sort of nested, right? We, we can't have a, a functioning society without a functioning environment. And we can't have a functioning economy without a functioning society and environment. So they're all sort of nested within each other. So now that you have this definition of sustainability in your back pocket, let's look at corporate social responsibility. 
So CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, and you'll hear me refer to it interchangeably here, um, considers a company or business entity as part of a broader social system and includes the effects of that company's actions on society beyond what we typically think of as just a market response or a legal response. And we'll dig into some really more specific examples in a second. But it's, it's important to, to note here um, that the beyond legal or market action is really sort of an, an operative phrase within this definition. So let's look at a couple of concepts of corporate social responsibility. So this is not a new term. It may feel like it is it's been pretty popular in the past few years. This term is actually over 40 years old. Um, and so this idea of corporate social responsibility actually has um, roots far, far beyond even 1979. But when you first see the term come up, um, it's in, in Carol's work on um, the ways that uh, businesses are ethically responsible um, to, to different entities that they support and serve. And so this definition from Carol that businesses are responsible to societies in economic, legal, ethical, and philanthropic ways is where you first start to see that idea of corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility also sort of relies on a social contract. Um, and that unspoken social contract between the business and the society um, grants certain rights to the business in exchange for certain responsibilities. And we'll look at some of um, those rights and responsibilities as we dig into to different businesses in a minute. One important construct within corporate social responsibility is the idea of stakeholders importance to this relationship. So a stakeholder is any group or individual who can affect or is affected by the achievement of an organization's purpose. Um, so you know, that's just sort of a, a wordy way of saying it's anybody who interacts with a business, right? You're considered a stakeholder because you buy a product or you're considered a stakeholder because you serve on the board of trustees. Um, because you have a role in that business entity's existence as a consumer or even as important as a stakeholder. Um, so therefore, it's in the company's best interest to appreciate, understand, and react to the interests of all stakeholders, not just members of the board, but also you as a consumer have power and a voice here. So with the main concepts of corporate social responsibility, let's sort of shift and complicate our definition of sustainability with our understanding of corporate social responsibility. So just as we started with the environment before, um, when people are talking about corporate social responsibility, occasionally they will edit um, that definition of sustainability to people, planet, and profit, the three Ps. Um, a lot, you'll see that a lot of times. You'll also see it as the triple bottom line. Um, and the three Ps or the triple bottom line are really just those same ideas that we started with in sustainability, but instead we're calling them people, planet, and profit. Um, and so let's Go back over here. So in corporate social responsibility, what we mean when we talk about the planet, um, we're not just looking at environmental health. For a business owner, that may mean considering emissions, um, being mindful of climate change and its impacts on your business or on your bottom line. And then also sort of blending into the profit side over here, being mindful of uh, your resource and materials management. So looking really critically at uh, pollution, at waste, at how you manage waste as a business owner, and um, where your inputs come from. So if you're 
um, producing something in a factory? You know, where do your raw materials come from? So that's a planet. Let's look at people. Um, obviously, when we're thinking about people within a business, we're looking at labor rights. Um, so we don't use child labor. We don't use forced labor. Um, we afford people the right to organize and we keep in mind our employees' safety. Yes, this is all part of corporate social responsibility, right? Because remember, the people who work in a business are stakeholders. So they have um, a voice in determining how their business is run. And if they're not able to work there safely, they're not being treated well as stakeholders, right? Um, so we also have to keep in mind um, community rights. So um, adherence to local tax regulations. Um, and then non-interaction uh, non or avoiding cooperation with, with the bad guys. Um, so you know, that might mean um, explicitly not working with uh, a, an unofficial government in a, com in a country where uh, the official government has been overthrown. Um, so that's the people side. Let's take a look at profit, the economic side of sustainability on our previous slide changes into profit when we talk about corporate social responsibility. And of course, that also, again, I can't repeat it enough, um, it also has a bearing on resource and materials management. But we also have to look specifically at the ways that businesses engage in job creation. Um, are they fairly compensating the people that work for them? Um, and then are they adhering to public revenue um, and tax concerns as well as, as a good corporate citizen, right? So one of the things that I think it's important for us to highlight in the definition of corporate social responsibility is how thoroughly entwined all three of these parts of corporate social resp responsibility are um, with each other, right? And then with the work that any particular business does. Um, a lot of people, when we talk through big ideas in corporate social responsibility, um, they might ask about how in the world we got here. Um, and for some businesses, and we'll talk about um, some of them in a little bit, um, for some businesses, this idea of corporate social responsibility is sort of intrinsic to who they are. Um, but for others, these changes came about a little less organically. Um, and so big drivers of corporate social responsibility and drivers of the CSR conversation for different businesses um, can start from a bunch of different ways. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, well, I'll start from the top. So. Uh, non-governmental organization activism. So you'll see a lot of uh, businesses get influenced by NGOs, um, private citizens, and other groups who might you know, start a Twitter campaign or a general social media campaign to force a business's hand to be more uh, socially responsible in the work that they do. You'll also occasionally see litigation. Um, and this is especially true of environmental changes, right? So when you have a company that is a major polluter um, that engages poorly with the environment and its stakeholders at the same time um, and gets pulled into some lawsuit or um, some legal action regarding their behavior, they have to clean up their act both literally and figuratively. They probably have to clean up a mess that they made. Um, and then they also make changes that are social, more socially responsible at the end of the day in the work that they do. Sometimes you'll see government initiatives. Um, I've worked in a handful of states where um, state governments have awarded incentives or additional support to businesses that implement good CSR practices in the work that they do. Um, so increasing wages, um, increasing environmental um, action within their community, um, good corporate social, good corporate citizens, sorry, that um, engage in community volunteerism is one big one. And we'll talk a little bit about a business that does that here in the Overland Park area in a second. 
Um, a lot of times you'll see uh, carbon related goals from a supplier up a supply chain. That's especially true of one business that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and maybe we'll start with that one. Um, also businesses look to develop new markets and um, especially developing new and younger markets, um, younger consumers. Um, there, there's a trend among US consumers and well, really international consumers um, to purchase more socially responsible products. And so developing new markets affords a, a business a way to, to do that. Um, last but never least, as I mentioned, also developing foreign markets um, allows or encourages businesses, I should say, to adapt um, and implement more corporate social, corporate social responsibility um, concerns within their products or within their supply chains. So let's look at some businesses who do this well or maybe don't, maybe they don't. So in our previous slide, I mentioned um, supply chain drivers for corporate social responsibility work. And Walmart is the biggest example of a supply chain driver um, and, and CSR work that I could come up with. Um, and so um, as Walmart has um, focused more of their market share on organic um, and recycled content um, products within their uh, items that they sell in the store, that has really shifted all the way down their supply chain to individual producers from which they, they buy. And so um, from something as simple as a recycled content paper notebook, um, you know, producing an item that contains recycled content is going to make recycling a more valuable enterprise. And so what you see as um, big corporations like Walmart have been more mindful of things going on down their supply chain, you see an increased production of those items um, for sale. And so you see their suppliers also changing their practices. And so what you see is um, as carbon related goals become really important at the top of the supply chain, they become equally important lower down the supply chain as well. So I should have stayed there. Let's look at another one. Um, so Patagonia is one of um, those companies that has really um, been mindful of environmental concerns from the beginning, right? Um, but they did some developing of, of new markets with one particular product that they rolled out uh, a few years ago now. And it's their product that has recycled content um, fleece. So the, the PET, fleece that you may see. Um, a lot of times the Patagonia label will have a little notation that says this fleece contains X number of plastic water bottles. Um, and you're starting to see that from a handful of uh, especially outdoor wear producers now. So from the outside, this is an awesome thing, right? You're creating a material that is based in a recycled item. You're removing something from the landfill in order to create the product you want, whether it be a fleece or a t-shirt or a pair of socks or whatever. But there's a problem with fleece that contains recycled PET plastic or recycled water bottles. Um, and some of you may know what that problem is. Um, it's that those items, those clothing items, once they're washed, shed that plastic into our, our water, into not only our drinking water, but our groundwater. Um, and so we're seeing um, not only microplastics show up in drinking water and groundwater, we're also, because plants are watered with water, we're also seeing plastics show up in plants now. And so 
Um, in the Patagonia solution, um, it actually created a different problem. And Patag so let's be honest, let's be fair, Patagonia wasn't the only group that was doing this. Um, Patagonia is just one that a lot of people think about um, when they think of recycled plastic content fleeces. Um, the solution, by the way, I, I get a lot of questions about this. The solution to um, the, the fleece leaching all the plastics into the water stream is actually to use a, a bag um, so you can do a quick Google search for uh, laundry bags that stop plastic shedding. Um, purchase yourself one of those and that will allow you to keep using um, that Patagonia fleece or that other um, item that uses recycled water bottles without being worried about uh, further contaminating our drinking groundwater. Um, so one, let's look at Interface. Um, this is one particular company that takes its uh, waste stream incredibly seriously. Um, Interface is also a company that's very popular at JCCC. We, we do a lot of work with them. Um, and next time you're on campus, if you want to see Interface products at work and you're inside, look down. Interface is a major carpet producer or a floor covering producer, as I, I think they prefer to be called now. Um, but one of the things that Interface is famous for is their carpet tile. And so Interface's carpet tiles um, are produced from reclaimed, recovered um, from, from the ocean and recycled um, plastics, not just um, recovered and recycled carpet, which that's part of their, their supply chain, but also recovered ocean plastics. And so um, with ocean, ocean pollution, um, what you see is a lot of nets, large, large buoys, ropes, um, things that, that can get tangled um, and harm sea life and um, ships for that matter. And so what Interface does, um, part of their supply chain is recovering that pollution from the ocean and turning it into something valuable, carpet tiles. Um, the other cool thing about what Interface does is when they go into a building um, and you have broad loom carpet on the floor, that's the carpet that doesn't have a tile mark in it. So that's usually the, the big carpet that you probably have in your home. Um, when you go into a space and they have broad loom carpet on the, on the floor, Interface will remove that carpet and then recycle it into, upcycle it into something else useful. Um, another example that's near and dear to my heart here in the Kansas City area is Boulevard Brewing. Um, so that's not just because I enjoy their products. Uh, Boulevard also does an outstanding job with glass recycling. Um, and so for those of you who live here in the Kansas City area, you've probably seen the ripple glass bins around, the big purple bins with the, the bottle with the wings on it. Um, Ripple is actually uh, what started as a Boulevard initiative. So Boulevard is a brewing company, produces their, their beer, they bottle it, they saw a, an issue in the supply chain and a way that they could help close that loop for that supply chain. And so what Boulevard uh, started doing not long after they opened their doors was they rolled out giant purple dumpsters to collect Kansas City area glass waste. Um, that glass is then milled, turned into cullet, um, which is, it basically looks like big lumpy sand. Um, so it's ground glass. Um, and then it is delivered to a corning, where, a corning factory in Gardner, Kansas. So just, just across the state line in Gardner. And at Gardner, they make fiberglass insulation. And that insulation then goes into homes. And so you have a raw product that is started from a waste material that goes into a long-term use product in people's homes that also creates a local job. And so I know I've got other um, businesses listed here, but we're not going to talk about all of them. Well, I'll, t I'll mention one more since we do have a JCCC connection there. Um, but Boulevard's really, really a, a useful object lesson in a corporation doing good work within a community.
Um, we'll mention UPS um, because we work so often and so closely with them in the Center for Sustainability. Um, so UP UPS, as one of their uh, employee initiatives, offers paid volunteer work days for folks that work with them. Um, and as part of those volunteer uh, days, can different groups from UPS will go out into the community and do some sort of public service work. Um, they award a grant along with that, and JCCC has been the recipient of a few of those grants through, through my time on campus. Um, but one of the things that they traditionally do with us as a recipient is plant trees. And so on the JCCC campus, as you drive uh, past the gym, the plant, the trees that are planted on the side of the road away from the gym, um, depending on which way you're traveling, your left or your right, the ones that are planted there closest to the ball fields. Um, that's one example of trees that were planted on a UPS grant. It was an outstanding day. It was beautiful. We got together with a team of folks from UPS and got to go play in the dirt all day. It was fantastic. Um, and it also gave us a chance to both improve our campus and to meet some members of our community in a little different way than in the past. And so we've been really fortunate to work with UPS through the years. And that's one of the ways um, that they, they do corporate social responsibility work. Um, within their business model. So let's take a look at sort of the other side of CSR. And that's that we encourage folks to beware of greenwashing. And so greenwashing is this practice where um, businesses see an opportunity to make a sale or to make additional money by looking to be more environmentally competent and friendly than they really are. Um, and I haven't always used this particular graphic for MVP, um, but it's one that's fairly useful. And so in uh, 2000, um, BP rolled out some additional uh, sustainability related power and um, renewable energy options, I should say, um, within their portfolio. And this was the sort of graphic that you saw that was really popular when this whole project rolled out. There's energy security and energy diversity. Um, and, and while I agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment, I think it's important to note that the vast majority of the portfolio um, that BP had, even as they rolled this out, the majority of their portfolio was in unidirectional extractive industries, um, natural gas and oil. Um, and not so much in solar, wind, or biofuel. Um, and so this campaign actually ended a, um, not long after the Deepwater Horizon incident down in the Gulf of Mexico. And so you, you don't see this particular um, campaign out anymore, um, even though BP is still doing a bit of work um, that they do talk about in biofuel, solar, and wind the majority of their portfolio is still in extractive industries. So beware greenwashing, always be a little skeptical, always dig in a little bit to what you're being told about a particular environmental claim that a business has and make sure that they're not just there trying to build a new market with that marketing strategy. How can we make sure um, that businesses are doing what they say they're doing? We have a handful of different tools that corporations employ. One of them is called the Global Reporting Initiative. And the GRI um, basically forces businesses to look at economic, environmental, and social concerns. These should all feel very familiar to you since we've talked through the definitions of sustainability and corporate social responsibility. Um, but they encourage businesses to take a look at the way they are practicing each of these. They have businesses that participate in the GRI have to communicate um, publicly the ways that they're meeting each of these factors. And what GRI does that a lot of um, groups might not, especially for corporate social responsibility, is they look at materiality. So in other words, there is a threshold that a corporation has to cross before they can get credit for doing any of these other things. 
So again, materiality is the idea that there is a threshold that a business has to cross before they can get credit for doing any of these other things. So for instance, um, if you are um, not paying attention to your business's waste stream and you are consistently producing a considerable amount of waste and you are not transparently reporting that, you won't get credit for your environmental concerns. Um, you probably also won't get credit for some of your social concerns either because you're not being responsible with your product or the materials that you use to make it. Um, so let's use JCCC as a case study here for a second. Um, and while JCCC is not a reporter in the Global Reporting Initiative, we do report under the STARS report. Um, STARS is Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System. Um, and STARS is a product of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. And in STARS, we report under five different areas. You'll see that they're sort of similar to the three areas under which you report with the GRI. In uh, the STARS report, we obviously, because we're engaged in education, um, we report on academics, we report on student and community engagement, we report on operations. So that's air and climate, buildings, energy, food and dining, grounds, purchasing, transportation, and waste and water. Um, and then we also report on the ways that we plan and administer the work that we do in sustainability across our campus. And then we look at leadership and how we innovate um, in all of these ideas. I'll make sure that in the comments we link to our own STARS report at JCCC. Um, it is public. Remember, transparency is an important part of sustainability, both within a business and within a campus. Um, so all of this is a triennial report that is public um, and you can go in and, and read all the way down to some very granular ideas of the ways that we um, work on sustainability here at JCCC. But I'm gonna give you a few big examples. Um, and again, the links here will be in the comments. Um, we are uh, really focused on being better neighbors. Um, we're a large campus. We have a large campus footprint within the Overland Park community. And um, as a product of that, um, I should have put these in the opposite order. The stormwater project came first. And so that's over at our Quivira Road entrance if you're on campus. And if you're curious about more information there, um, the links will take you to a video about the stormwater project. Um, but what basically what that project does um, is it services, um, slows, cleans, and redistributes uh, water, rainwater runoff from about 20% of our total campus parking lots. Um, and that water is slowed and contained in a detention basin. Um, that basin and the area around it have been planted with uh, several thousand varieties of native plants. And so those flowers, forbs, and grasses all attract native wildlife and provide habitat for native wildlife um, right on the edge of campus. It's a beautiful space that does a great job, right? And so the job it does in slowing stormwater runoff allows our wide expanse of parking lots to not contribute to neighborhood flooding. So that's the sort of the cycle, right? large scale rain events on an impervious pavement parking lot can contribute to neighborhood flooding. We saw that was a problem um, and we solicited grant support to put in a stormwater installation, which we got, got the installation put in. Not only do we solve part of the first problem, the flooding problem, but we've also created this outstanding and beautiful space for native plants. Um, another example of being better neighbors is our community bird, our campus-wide bird study. Um, the bird study at JCCC uh, is one that has taught us a lot about the ways that both we and wildlife interact with our buildings, right? And so um, birds can't see windows. 
And when you're in a large campus environment with lots and lots of windows, um, we discovered pretty quickly that you kill a lot of birds. And it's not just native, it's not just um, local wildlife, it's also um, migratory birds, birds that are endangered or threatened in their home areas that are just flying through. Um, and so for the past three years, we've been collecting data on those bird strikes and those deaths. Um, we uh, work closely with area institutions. We are federally permitted to collect those bird mortalities. We work closely with area institutions to make sure that they can collect those mortalities and conduct further study um, on biodiversity, on uh, their health uh, prior to hitting the window and, and dying. Um, not all birds who hit windows die. And so we've also engaged in a great deal of wildlife saving um, through the years as we've done this. And so being a better neighbor by helping to preserve our bird life is also a good example of corporate social responsibility on our campus. We reduce cost and pollution um, both through our power switch program, which has increased our amount of solar um, on campus through the years astronomically. Um, the link to that will take you to um, details on our power mix at JCCC and our power purchasing agreement. Our PPA um, is something that's just sort of still new to me and new to us here at JCCC. Um, as our PPA uh, goes through and is implemented uh, statewide and across the region, uh, we will be able to increase the percentage of renewables in our power mix to close to 90, I think it's 93%, so around 90% of our total mix is going to be renewable. Um, so that allows us to both keep a more consistent cost level, even as we expand our um, buildings on campus and as we grow on campus. And it also allows us obviously to reduce pollution from our energy consumption. We work to generate new revenue streams for scholarships. Um, and we also pay our student labor equitably. Um, so interns in the Center for Sustainability, which I should mention, we're almost always hiring. If you're a JCCC student, take a look at the careers page to see if we have a position that you might be interested in. Um, employees in recycling and composting at JCCC are paid equitably. Uh, they receive a, a three credit hour uh, forgiveness, basically, um, reimbursement for, for one course that they take. Um, but they also contribute to our campus's scholarship fund. So recycling interns, compost interns, um, manage specialty recycling streams on campus that put revenue back into our scholarship fund and any student who receives a scholarship from JCCC, part of their funds will have likely come from somebody's appropriately recycled whatever, uh, plastic bottle, tin can, or lighting fixture. Um, we also do a lot of work to build student leadership through the Student Sustainability Committee. Um, and the work that we do in um, soliciting awards and grants as a campus helps to improve our external image. Um, and that's important, you know, as an institution, uh, we have students who choose to study with us because of our commitment to sustainability and it's important that we we maintain that image. We also have compliance concerns. Um, uh, we have external accreditors, um, especially in interior design and the culinary program. And those external accreditors are concerned with uh, sustainability related questions. So how do we manage our waste? What are we teaching our students about environmentally responsible design and construction? Um, those kinds of questions we help support. We are not the content experts in interior design or in the culinary program, but we do help our faculty to develop that curriculum um, and to have those conversations with their students. And then last but never least, um, our students are both our pride and joy and our main product, right? Um, and ideally, what we do in the Center for Sustainability is contribute to the development of educated, engaged citizens um, who can both benefit and contribute to lifelong learning experiences for themselves and for their communities. 
Um, and being engaged with sustainability at JCCC is definitely one of many ways um, to go about becoming a more engaged and educated citizen. So let's review. Um, so hopefully by now you can define sustainability as the overlap and intersection of social, environmental, and economic concerns. Um, sustainability is complex. It's more complex than recycling and, and energy. When you think through corporate social responsibility, you're just further complicating that idea of sustainability, right? You're looking at people, planet, and profit. You're looking at the ways that people interact with our planet to produce profit for themselves and for the businesses they serve. <clears throat> we know what motivates companies to adopt corporate social responsibility work, right? We know that those drivers can come from buyer initiatives and demand, from carbon related goals that have been set by a producer further up a supply chain, from government initiatives and support, from the desire to develop new markets with foreign customers, from litigation, and from activism from different groups um, that may support or otherwise influence a business. We know how we can protect ourselves against greenwashing claims, right? We can be a little skeptical when we look at the ways that businesses market themselves. And if we know that a business's primary production is in this example, in natural gas and oil, that when they start suddenly talking about renewable energy and biofuel, solar and wind, we might want to be a little questioning about that behavior, right? So we want to be smart consumers to avoid being hoodwinked by grain washers. And then last but never least, um, when we're back on campus or when you visit campus or check us out um, on the web, think through some of the examples of corporate social responsibility that you can identify on campus. Whether that's taking a look at our current homepage and seeing photos of the campus farm and solar on top of the student center, or whether it's walking around campus looking down and seeing an interface flooring product on the floor, you'll know where that product came from now, hopefully. Um, so with all of that, that's sort of our time for today wrapped up. I do want to let you know, um, we, some of us are in the office um, now um, as campus is, is reopening and looking at what fall means. Um, if you stop by the office, if you're on campus and you don't see us there, check us out on social media. Feel free to ask questions there. Um, my email address, I will put in the comments. I neglected to include it here. So I'll put my email address in the comments on YouTube um, so you can reach out to us there as well. And then obviously we encourage you to consider joining in the Student Sustainability Committee, um, applying to work with us in an, as an intern or a work study student, or just joining in our events, whether those are face-to-face -face or virtual through the years ahead. Um, and then citations for our sources today are here. And with that, it was a pleasure talking with you. I look forward to hearing more from you. I um, can't wait to answer your questions and I hope to see you soon.